say that we're... I'm going to switch, switch the gears a little, um, <laughs> because I feel like the biggest thing I've heard about people talk about in fintech actually in the last couple of years has been uh, cryptocurrency and the blockchain. I'm so <laughs> sorry to mention them. Yeah. I'm a skeptic myself, um, yeah. but I try to keep an open mind. Um, <laughs> what are you guys, where, what's, first of all, what's PayPal doing on this front? What are you guys? You know, we, we certainly stay close to it, um, you know, and uh, we've experimented with the technology a good bit. You know, as, as an engineer, I can appreciate the computer science breakthrough that blockchain represents. Not um, smoke and mirrors? <laughs> um, it is smoke and mirrors, just a little bit, yeah. isn't it? The, yeah. The, 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 uh, <laughs> I think the thing that has yet to happen, you know, the, the real breakthrough of blockchain is this notion of distributed trust. And uh, while that's a major breakthrough, there just aren't a lot of analogs to that uh, for, for people to look at and say, well, how would you operate something in a sort of fully decentralized trust model? And I think a lot of the early cycles uh, with blockchain have been people trying to go replace well-functioning central brokerages of trust with a distributed system. I think the bigger breakthroughs are going to happen when people start to apply that technology to problems that could only be solved through distributed trust. Right. I think the reason that's been a little slow going is, as I said, people don't have great analogs for that. Like, there's not a great you know, framework for like, oh, I see 100 different problems that are well solved by decentralized trust because it yeah. was a previously unsolved problem. Like, that was the brain yeah. teaser in, I mean, in school. Like, it I, wasn't solved before. I mean, wouldn't, isn't PayPal almost like the you know, counterpoint to it? It's like, why do we need that? We have PayPal. Yeah. I, well, I, isn't that isn't that what you would say? Because I mean, you guys have already built rails that you would you would consider secure. It's not like people are constantly defrauding each other on your network, are they? Well, I mean, or are they? Certainly, a big part of our value. <laughs> well, a big part of our value prop is yeah. that we broker trust. Right. Uh, we we provide buyer exactly. protection. We provide seller protection, and right. so certainly we do a lot to fight fraud. But we also guarantee both sides of the transaction uh, through, through buyer protection and seller protection, that is certainly a lot of what we do. Um, at the same time, you know, a lot of people will ask us like, well, does that mean that you know, it's a threat to you? And, and I look at it and say, you know, anything that helps to bring you know, more innovation sure. is, is something we want to get behind and that we want to encourage. Yeah. And like I said, I, I just think that um, it's going to take more experimentation for people to find the right problems to apply that technology to. I think that technology being applied to some problems that maybe it's not as well suited for, but as you find problems that could only be solved through decentralized right. trust, then I think you'll see some much more interesting use cases. Okay, on. now, sorry, Jacob, I'm gonna ask you a question, but are you guys trying to find those problems yourselves? We, Where are you sitting in the blockchain stuff? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we certainly look at some of those, um, and I think there are interesting examples of, you know, in any place where there's not a well-functioning central brokerage, I think are interesting places to go apply the technology. So um, cross-border uh, currency swaps are a good example. You know, if we're gonna go swap dollars to euros, you can do that in milliseconds at a super low cost, right? Um, but say you want to go swap, you know, Kenyan currency to Nigerian currency, you know, that's gonna take, you know, many, many days and you're going to pay a very high fee to go do that because you don't have great functioning central brokerages there. So right. there's some companies out there that are doing exactly that kind of thing to say, oh, well, what if you use you know, cryptocurrency to go make those currency swaps instead of going through a central brokerage? And there, taking seven or eight minutes on the blockchain to settle is way better than the three days it might have taken otherwise. But I think you've got, that's a good example of where you need the right use case Kenyan currency to Nigerian currency, great use case. Yeah. Dollars to euros, maybe not as much because right. you can settle much faster than what the blockchain could do. Okay, so you guys, if, if PayPal were to move into something in a blockchain-based solution, it may be in an area like that, either getting behind one of these companies or launching a service like that first, rather than um, just, I don't know, something else that's more you know, within the US or something, you know, yeah, buying a, products on the blockchain Yeah, or as something. a basic transaction processing system, yeah. you know, uh, you know, it's a public ledger. You know, Bitcoin, for example, is a public ledger. Uh, you know, taking seven or eight minutes to go settle in the world of transaction processing where things happen in milliseconds, it's not a replacement for that kind of transaction yeah. processing. But like in that currency swap example, I do think there's other things that it can yeah. work well for, and we're definitely staying close to those. Okay. 
Jacob, did you want to add something to that? And then I have another question for you on this to follow up on. No, I Will mean, you from, guys, have you from, guys from our perspective, I mean, we, we just try to, to uh, deliver to, to our merchants what they're looking for and sort of the most uh, frequently used sort of, uh, okay. payment methods and, and uh, sort of Bitcoin so, up until now has not been one of them. Right, so yeah. that, that was the second part of it all, of course, is that you've got the blockchain, which can be, is, is a kind of distributed architecture, but then you've got the cryptocurrencies yeah. that sit on top of it. How much have you had merchants on the iSettle platform start asking if they can take payments in Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever? Well, I mean, we, we were looking into sort of adding that as a payment Settle method. Coin. Uh, exactly, <laughs> adding that as a payment method a couple of years ago. Then the fluctuation, obviously, of, of, of uh, the cryptocurrencies and uh, sort of there, there is really no demand from, from sort of offline merchants. Yep. Right. At least they are selling sort of coffee to, to get paid with Bitcoin. So yep. yeah. from that perspective, we haven't done much. But as you said, Bill, uh, you know, w where it becomes interesting maybe for us is more so uh, from a back end perspective. If we can yeah. to replace some internal systems with sort of blockchain, that, that could make sense. Yeah. But that's yeah. as far as we've pushed it internally. Yeah. What about you guys? I mean, are, are we going to see a Venmo coin coming out soon or anything? <laughs> no, no, we're, we're, we're <laughs> not. so uh, silly. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, You're we, a big fan, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, Huge. We, <laughs> as Jacob was saying, we, we, fo we follow user demand. And, you know, we... we, we we were accepting Bitcoin for a while, I and mean, as Jacob said, you, you know, were doing what for a while? We were accepting Bitcoin for you were a while. Accepting, yeah. Um, uh, with Braintree, and it, it, you know, I, I think the, you know, the consumer demand is not there for that. But as, as Jacob was mentioning, we see a lot of consumer demand for alternative payment methods. And so, for example, like we recently launched Smart Payment Buttons, which is democratizing access in the world of e-commerce uh, for small businesses all the way to large businesses yeah. to get to whatever form of payment somebody wants to pay with. And so if that does yeah. become something that you start to see the consumer demand, we've created a, a scalable infrastructure where a merchant can easily say, oh, well, flip that on for me, and the merchant's not doing a new integration to go add you know, a locally relevant payment method to go into a new yeah. market, or as consumers change their preferences to go add whatever consumers are, are Nicely preferring Nicely converted with. the question there, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> but just to bring it back to the cryptocurrency, <laughs> I think that's really important, by the way, what you've just described. Yeah. It's, a, it's so fragmented. I mean, it's, yeah. once you start looking at payments globally, it's mm. like really surprising because I think people just unique think that cards, if you live in the West somewhere, you assume <clears throat> card, card payments, whether it's debit or credit, is, is all that's needed, but it's really not even That's exactly what we surface. realized over the last couple of years from yeah. our perspective, that you know, w when we started, I think the, the payment landscape was actually a lot easier for merchants to, to yeah. be dealing yeah. with. It was basically MasterCard, Visa, and American Express from a card payment perspective, and then PayPal. But now the, the, you know, the multitude of payment options yeah. you know, in, in the Nordics with Swish, Vips, Mobile Pay, yeah. you know, these bank to bank transfer Absolutely. schemes that's really you know, escalating really fast. Yeah. You know, the demand for those types of um, payment solutions to be accepted at point of sales is much, much higher compared yeah. to crypto. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> so, so no, 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 no driver yet to try to create your own cryptocurrency or start taking oh. some of the, the, the more popular ones. Not from us, from, no. uh, from merchants or buyer uh, consumers or anything like that? No, I mean, yeah. just the... Um, if you do you look think at it's... Uh, let, me, let me put it differently, because I've already asked you this question, yeah. but do you think it's um, a healthy market right now? Well, I mean, you certainly see that um, some of what's out there is speculation yeah. uh, on the currency. So you got to... Uh, I'm certainly not the only one to say this. Lots of folks have talked about this. Uh, sort of separating out the technology from the currency. Yeah. I think the technology, there's a lot of interesting things that will happen. Yeah. Um, as I was saying before, you just need to apply the technology to the problems that are best suited for it. Yeah. I think on the currency side, you know, uh, there's certainly been a lot of people that are engaging in currency speculation there, which I don't know that that's a healthy thing, which is why we've chosen not to really participate in that aspect yeah. of it. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not paying very close attention to the technology uh, and, and, and what could be there. And even the things I was mentioning, you know, part of, part of you know, what you do as, a, as an innovator is be prepared to adapt 
as yeah. things evolve. And so, like I mentioned on smart payment buttons, like there's a bunch of things like that that we're doing to say, well, hey, we know we can't perfectly predict. Yeah. We want to be flexible such that we're prepared for the fact that you can't perfectly predict how yeah. markets evolve, but that we can be flexible and adaptive as, as markets evolve. Which is a great thing to say because that segues into my next question. I wanted to ask you guys what you thought about Amazon's cashierless stores. Do you think that that's something that could actually become ubiquitous, or do you think it's a marketing stunt by Amazon? And if well, it's that, ubiquitous, uh, do you, how will you adapt to that one? Well, it, I, I think it's an interesting experiment. I think it, it, it will, you know, eventually we'll see whether it's something that, that actually works. But I, my personal view is that we'll see some sort of hybrid of the yeah. sort of completely um, sort of digitized offline retail store and, and someone with actual people selling things in it. But you know, the transformation of retail right now is, is crazy and a lot of, sort of retailers are really feeling the, yeah. the, the, the stress of Amazon and, and the likes. I think that's right. I think in the world of retail, you, know, you see it every day with stores closing, going bankrupt. These kinds of there's going to be more change in the world of retail in the next five years than there's oh. been in the last 50. And I think the question really is, as those retailers work to adapt, um, you know, how do you go give them access to the kinds of tools that previously had been reserved yeah. only for the largest few? And I think yeah. that's a really important thing that you know, we endeavor to go do, that we want to go give access to the many uh, to engage in those kind of capabilities. But I think that's going to be a very important theme across the industry for the next 10 years, is how do you make it so that many players get to participate in that versus only a privileged few having access to those kinds yeah. of capabilities. That's always, that's always the theme, isn't it? And to yeah. summarize, yeah. that's sort of the, the whole logic behind yeah. the two yeah. of us sitting here together. So. Exactly right. Yeah, But does that mean that you guys are working on cashless now? <laughs> well, we're, we're, uh, we, we, certainly care, we certainly care a lot about <laughs> yeah. you know, innovation in the store. We see that blurring yeah. together. We see that you know, a lot of what we're doing with mobile payments, uh, you know, like this past Black Friday, for the first time, we had over a billion dollars in mobile payment volume in a single day. Yeah. Then cross that again on Cyber Monday. But that's a great example of how you see the digital world and the physical world really starting to come together. The Black Friday that used to be a completely physical world event now is as much about digital as it Absolutely. is about in store, but those yeah. are merging together. So that's a big focus for us, and that is, as Jacob was saying, a, you know, a primary driver of us working together is to say, we want to combine those digital capabilities with great yeah. in-store capabilities like what Jacob and his team have been working on. Okay, we're out of time, but thank you so Excellent. much, you guys. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. All right.